Hi everyone, uh, my name is Emily and this is my first video I suppose in a series called Thoughts from a Bathtub which is just going to be about, I mean me reading books really, like there might be the odd occasion where maybe I review an album or a TV series or something I like but it's really just an extension of my Instagram series that I was doing which was literally just me reading books and reviewing them with no expertise or <laughs> not just some expertise uh, but nothing professional you know like it's like Vincent van Gogh was a naive artist I'm a naive reviewer um yeah don't expect great things <laughs> it's you know, this is it's very much going to be a, a low-key sort of thing. I'm not going to put a lot of editing into it. Um, I'll probably put some piano music in the background. Um, I doubt I'm going to be monetizing these videos, so probably some Chopin, who knows? Um, but yeah, it's going to be just a chill time. I, hopefully, it feels a bit like sitting down for a cup of coffee with me and uh, talking about a book which may or may not be your cup of tea but if you have come from my instagram story thank you very much and if you've come from youtube in general or spotify in general uh thank you for coming i guess i should explain the name the name is from a tweet from someone i've actually forgotten the handle of i should have written it down before i started filming but i'll put that in the bio bio not bio description <laughs> there we go uh it's a very funny tweet um i'll probably link it actually so you can read the tweet for yourself but it was just pointing out the fact that uh nowadays when we talk about things in an academic context we're expected to reference and all of this sort of thing uh and in the past they just had some thoughts some shower thoughts or bathtub thoughts as the case may be and they just said them and as i'm doing as I'm not hoping to make this like a formal thing where I do reference where my ideas are coming from, I thought that was quite an apt name. Uh, but our first episode today was starting with this book, which I actually don't know if it will come up the right way round. Maybe I'll do some editing and flip myself, uh, as you can see. But it's Marie Antoinette by Antonia Fraser and I have just finished it. I read it for my dissertation. Usually these book reviews that I do are for um, my own amusement but this one was actually yeah, read for a purpose. It was read for helping with my dissertation which is going to be on Marie Antoinette among other people and as it's quite a pivotal biography it seemed like a good place to start. But let's start by talking about uh, Antonia Fraser herself, the author. Now, I know this has nothing to do with Antonia Fraser and um, we shouldn't really talk about women in regards to their husbands. However, I just discovered that she is the widow of Harold Pinter of um, Pinter Paws fame, if you do English lit or you're interested in modern theatre. And I just thought that was a fun little tidbit. So there you go. Uh, it has nothing to do with this. So, she, very well respected historian, studied at Oxford, or whatever they call it, they call it reading at Oxford or something, I don't know. <laughs> I should know, but I don't. Um, she won the Wolfson History Award, not for this book, but for um, her book on the lives of women in 17th century, I forget the name. Um, and she, when she wrote this book, it became the source for Sophia Capella's 2006 movie of the same name, Marie Antoinette, which you may have seen. I actually watched it, oh, it must have, I was about to say the other day, but it must have been about a month or so ago with my flatmate Francis, shout out. Um, it's a very stylized movie. I don't think, although this is the source of that movie, I don't think the movie accurately reflects um, the book. Think of it like 
the half blood prince you know that scene in the movie where they blow up the burrow for no reason that's kind of what that movie is like um although i i guess the essence of the the essence of the portrayal of marie antoinette that antonia fraser gives which we're going to get into is there it's just very much a, a chick flick movie it's actually interesting I, I read an article on it the other day um that was talking about how actually the chick flick genre um used my internet because they it was kind of creating an empathy i guess for her because she was only 14 when she came to france and chick flicks obviously tend to be teen films all that sort of thing I and mean, it's a bit of a derogatory term anyway isn't it chick flick but you know what i all mean by that um so yeah, it was meant in the 2000s for, for women to relate to Marie Antoinette. And I think it did do a good job at presenting her as um, a likeable character. But it did take a lot of liberties. Um, but hey, I recommend it. Go watch it. <laughs> um, where to start? So, I mean, I usually split these reviews when I used to do them on my Instagram story into writing style and content so i'm pretty much gonna keep that the same so let's start with writing style i thought actually it's very well written it did slog a bit in the end uh but to be honest biographies you know you, that tends to happen people's lives are long i mean marie antoinette i believe died age 39 Please correct me in the comments if I'm wrong. Don't actually, I won't. I won't respond. I won't read them. Uh, I will read the comments, but I won't read the one correcting me on her age. Um, we have Wikipedia for that. She, you know, only lived around therefore circa forty years. So it's quite an impressive amount, I think, for forty years. It's quite a life. I'm sure if my life was a biography, it would be like that big. Nothing much happened so far. Um, it was really... <laughs> I felt it flowed quite naturally. It felt like you were sort of... You, you vouched for Marie Antoinette, which... I mean, Antonia Fraser insists the whole way through that she's an unbiased view. And maybe she is. I think she is. But I also think there's a distinct fondness for Marie Antoinette throughout. But I also think it's hard to not be fond of Marie Antoinette if you, um, maybe fond's the wrong word, sympathetic to Marie Antoinette if you know anything about what happened to her uh, and her life. So I can't fault Antonia Fraser there. But yeah, it's a very easy read, I thought. Um, it gets sad near the end, as expected. Although I was surprised by how, like, sad I was but a very good bug feel than all it didn't it didn't feel too clinical but it didn't feel too obviously uh, biased I suppose shouldn't really use the word biased but there you go and I would I would recommend it I think if you're interested in learning more about Marie Antoinette whether you're just a, a casual sort of uh, fan if you like French history, if you're interested in the 19th century, if the politics of absolutism and its decline interests you, uh, any of those reasons, I'd pick it up and have a read. It, it's really well done. And it has lots of pictures, which I actually love in biographies. I love to look at the... I like to be able to visualise the people, especially when there's a lot of foreign names um from my perspective anyway and uh, some of them are very similar and there's a lot of comps and duchess and all this sort of thing it's nice to be able to see who they're talking about hi sorry my phone ran out of memory um she's actually a blessing in disguise because i realized watching the video back that i hate that angle that i was filming from before it made me look like this which I don't, I swear, I'm prettier than that. 
Okay, so <laughs> I was actually prattling on for a few minutes before I realised that it had cut off. So I gotta get back to where I was. Um, which was, I think I just sort of finished discussing the writing style and so now I should move on to content. And it's hard to talk about content in a book like this because most of it's just fact, right? If, it, if a biography is done well, then a lot of it shouldn't really have much of an argument. It should be stating the facts, the idea is that you come to your own conclusions but this person has compiled all the facts of someone's life for you. Um, but at the same time, any competent historian generally has opinions, and Antonia Fraser certainly has an opinion. So I guess to analyse content, we should start with her epilogue. Start at the end, which is where she makes the statement well, her own, of her own view, I suppose. And she tries to answer the age-old question of was any of what happened Marie Antoinette's fault? Now, no one is infallible, right? Um, people make mistakes. And Marie Antoinette, as Antonia Fraser points out, made many, right? Um, a lot of that was down to her own ignorance. She wasn't politically minded, she was not well educated, because her mother, she was one of the youngest of Maria uh, Theresa's many, many, many children, and uh, therefore got the least amount of education, because she wasn't expected to marry anyone important through a lot of uh, unforeseen circumstances she ended up marrying the Dauphin of France but that's um, that wasn't planned necessarily the Dauphin who would become Louis the 16th was supposed to marry someone else um, so she therefore wasn't educated very well which meant she couldn't sensibly advise her husband also she was very she could be very frivolous um, she we all probably know the famous image of Marie Antoinette in her big excessive gowns and her excessive wigs, the, the famous one being Mom of the Ship. There's the diamond necklace affair, uh, which if you know your French history you might It happened again because my phone hates me. Anyway, <laughs> so where was it? The diamond necklace of her, yeah. Uh, if you know anything about your French history, you might know that she was accused of um, buying this ridiculously expensive diamond necklace um, when she didn't actually, in a time when France was in a financial crisis. In reality, it was a scam um, from someone, uh, someone just, I think, on the outskirts of the French court who pretended to be her. And, but that really stuck, that she never wore a necklace again in all her life, uh, because it was such a huge scandal, and it really turned public opinion against her. And as I was saying, still we have this image of her as very frivolous. Uh, let the meat cake, for example, never actually happened. Maria Antoinette never actually said that. But it, it did stick to her. And in a way, it wasn't wrong. In her youth, she was frivolous. She was. She did gamble a lot. She did spend lots of money. Of course, we have to put that into perspective of what other royals were spending at the time. As Antonia Fraser does say, like, the French court was leaking money. And it wasn't just Marie Antoinette, it was the whole of the royal family were just spending money like it grew on trees. Um, but she was a part of that. However, I think where Antonia Fraser's argument is most interesting is that she says a lot of her frivolity came from her unhappiness in her marriage. Um, and even though Louis the Sixteenth and Marie Antoinette can be said to actually have had have finished their marriage in quite a loving place, like they did genuinely care about each other. Before when they were originally married, things were very different because Louis the Sixteenth, for whatever reason, I don't want to speculate, there's a lot of different theories, no one knows for sure, 
didn't consummate the marriage, which means for the first seven years of her um, time as Dauphine of France, and then I think for a little period as Queen of France, she didn't have any children. And everyone around her, all of the, I guess, competitors for the throne, Louis XVI brothers, were all having children. And she was a very maternal person by nature, a very compassionate person. She, she wanted children, and the fact she didn't have them allowed the French court to look down on her. And it's interesting that Antonia says that that period at the start that impotency contributed significantly to Marie Antoinette's downfall because it gave the French people a reason to dislike her because she wasn't producing an heir and it also gave them an opportunity to suggest that she had lots of lovers um, and that she was and it also gave them an opportunity to suggest the king wasn't very dominant and therefore she as a a foreign Austrian woman was domineering him, all these sorts of things. And it also meant another very interesting point that the because Louis the Sixteenth wasn't a particularly sexual man and he didn't really he didn't care to have a mistress, he thought the way his grandfather Louis the Fifteenth had run his court was sort of despicable and he didn't want a mistress. But because of this, political power, which generally in the French court was well, influence of the king let's say, was split between ministers, official mistress, queen, right? What it meant when he didn't have an official mistress because he wasn't a very sexual person, it meant that everyone thought Marie Antoinette was, like, controlling him because she had sole influence over him rather than having, say, a Madame du Pompadour or a Madame du Barry to combat that, which I thought was a very interesting point. Um, all in all, I think I agreed with her conclusion. I think she is clearly a very competent biographer. I think she did what most biographers tend to do, which is sometimes, though she was relatively good at this, to be honest, but sometimes they underplay the humanness of people in the past, right? Um, there was a lot of emphasis made over, not, well, not as much as there could have been, but there was quite some emphasis made over her possible affair with Count Ferzen. And Tony and Fraser was of the opinion that they probably were having an affair. I don't know. I haven't been through the archives. I'd have to trust her judgement, but I think it's it's equally important is that there was actually a lot of love between Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette. Whether that was romantic love, or familial love, or platonic friendship even near the end, whatever it is, there was a great amount of affection there, and that becomes very apparent at the end. Uh, because, of course, they all came to rather a sticky end. I think the most important thing that I learned from this book was what a family unit the royal family in France were, which was very rare. And therefore how sad it is what happened to them in the end. Because they were both not very well educated. They both couldn't handle it basically, the pressure. Louis XVI wasn't qualified to run the country. Even if Marie Antoinette had tried to help him, she wasn't very competent, and he didn't want her help anyway, because he, being French, was still mildly suspicious of her being an Austrian, although I think they got over that near the end. Um, they were both very compassionate people who just were a bit ignorant. And sadly, their ignorance meant that they were, and, and bad luck, frankly, ignorance and bad luck meant that they suffered, they were scapegoated, which Antonia Fraser makes a point of at the end. They became scapegoats for 
a wider problem with monarchy as a concept, problems that had been developing since Louis the Fourteenth, and I'd say probably reached their peak in Louis the Fifteenth. Okay, Louis the Sixteenth didn't cause all of these problems. He was just the wrong person at the wrong time. And how much it's just sad how much happier they would have been, probably, had it just. I mean, no doubt they were spoilt, but had they maybe been the second son and, you know, the, a more obscure royal couple, it's unlikely anyone would have perhaps had a problem with them. Um, and the way the revolutionaries went about not only executing them, but forcing their son to suggest that Marie Antoinette had sexually abused him when very much not the case. Um, all these sort of undermining of their family, which was so unnecessary. Um, as someone point, as Antonio Face pointed out, a lot of people, because uh, Louis the Sixteenth had fought in the war for American independence, not personally, obviously, but he had involved France in that war. The Americans were quite happy to take um, Marie Antoinette and Louis XVI in, as they had taken in the Stuarts earlier, so James II. Um, and it is just sad that the French, under Robespierre, were so in such a frenzy that two people who didn't quite deserve it got all the blame for everything and for a completely fruitless reason really because the monarchy uh, you may or may not know was reinstated in France uh, after Napoleon so and Napoleon himself was an emperor and after the monarchy was reinstated and after the second republic you get the uh, second empire which was Napoleon the third so it's just it's just a shame but I thought it was a really interesting book, and I think it's very important if you've ever had an opinion on Marie Antoinette or Louis XVI, or if you're a Republican, uh, by which I mean a literal Republican, not an American Republican, or you're anti-monarchy, or any of these things, if you have any of these opinions. Now, I'm not saying they're wrong or right, but I'm saying that um, we learn from history, and... I would hope that this is a tale that people learn from, because you have to remember that humans, regardless of where they are, are humans, and they can't be as easily written off as just like, oh well, they were the French monarchy in the uh, 18th century, they were horrible. That's not quite the case. They were very unlucky. And badly raised. Just genuinely. I, I just blame the parents. Maria Theresa, a terrible parent, okay? Um, okay, Louis XVI's parents were dead. But <laughs> his grandfather, Louis XV, terrible, right? And it's just, it's just sad. Anyway, that was kind of a bummer of a name to end on. But a uh, really good book recommend it. There's, there's the cover again for you. Um, if you enjoyed this review, please leave a like or a comment or just ooh, subscribe. You could subscribe. That'd be even better. Um, do check out other stuff on my channel. I do a lot of singing and stuff like that. Uh, but if you liked this book review, there'll be another one coming soon. I'm sure I'm about to finish Orlando by Virginia Woolf at some point. Uh, but I guess a quick summary Writing style, nine, yeah, eight or nine, around there, say eight. Uh, always room for improvement. Content, yeah, it's very good. Biography, I've got, for a biography, I've got to give it 10 out of 10. So, probably uh, nine out of 10 overall. There you go. Thumbs up, Emily approved. Uh, thank you for listening to Thoughts from a Bathtub, and I'll see you next time.